So the, the, maybe you've read what I was written. Basically, I was saying that we are trying to separate the movement of the electrons from the nuclei, okay? And, and the mathematical way to do that is to write in terms of the wave function that the many body wave function is written as a product of a part that basically depends on the position of the electron and a part that depends on the position of the nuclei, okay? And so here, we're gonna assume, as I said, that the nuclei are fixed and they can be considered so, and that we are studying the electrons in a given position, a set of position of the nuclei. And these nuclei basically generate an external potential in which the electrons are integrated, okay? So, and this potential is written as Vx in uh, the following, okay? And so we focus now still on a many body wave function, but it's purely an electronic wave function. And so in this case, the particle are written as R1 to Rn, okay? So what we have to do to, uh, to um, obtain this wave function is to solve the Schrodinger equation. There. So uh, to the, the Schrodinger equation that consists of the Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian includes the kinetic energy of the electron. So that's the term that you have here. And then there is this external potential that I mentioned before. And then finally, you have the interactions between the electron. And that's the annoying term. This is the term that really annoys us in this equation, okay? Indeed, I mean, uh, if we didn't have that, and we'll see, that would make our life way easier, okay? So one way to solve this equation is, well, not to solve it, it's rather to, to try to find a solution to this equation, is to, um, yeah, basically we can solve it analytically only for two electrons, but the other approach is to do a numerical simulation, and you do a numerical simulation taking into account what is known, the fact that we have a variational principle on the energy of the system. So, um, the energy of one given wave function uh, phi, that's the one that's here, okay, basically is written as the, the, the bracket uh, uh, phi h phi divided by the norm of uh, phi. And this gives the energy associated to a given wave function. And thanks to the variational principle, we know that if we know the wave function of the ground state, and I don't know why this is not okay, the wave function of the ground state phi, psi, sorry, then the energy for uh, the wave function of the ground state is necessarily smaller than the one of any other wave function phi, okay? So if you come up with any idea of a wave function, okay, you can dream of a wave function, and then the energy associated to that wave function is gonna be higher than the one of the ground state, okay? And so basically the technique is trying to build some wave function phi, okay? And then try to minimize the energy as a function of that wave function, okay? So typically the way you do it is that you're going to define this wave function as a function of a number of parameters. In this case, I'm just taking uh, uh, the example of a, a wave function that would depend only on one parameter, A. In that case, you have to minimize the energy as a function of that parameter a, okay? So the, the thing is that, of course, to be able to do that, okay, you need to do uh, two things. You need to be able to evaluate the energy. So you need to evaluate the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. And then the other thing is that you need to come up with some nice, um, and I mean, something, when I say nice, is something that allows you to go as close as possible to the minimum uh, for the trial wave function. Because if I just put one parameter there, of course, you know, I'm going to be limited on the kind of wave function that I had. And so I'm going to be most probably well above the minimum of the actual um, energy of the ground state wave function. Okay. Now, two questions. Why did, you, why did you call it Monte Carlo? And why yeah. did you call it I was going to, 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 yeah, so I didn't mention that. I was fast, I should have mentioned it. I said that the main difficulty was 
there are two difficulties. I said one is the wave function. So what's the form of the wave function? And the other one is uh, um, how do you evaluate this, uh, this function E, okay? And so one way to evaluate it is to uh, basically represent this thing for a different, uh, a different position in space, okay? And you then compute H psi, a psi again, so psi h psi or phi h phi, okay, at different position in space by sampling the space. That's why it's called Monte Carlo. So you sample the space, okay, in different position, and you assume that by doing so, you have some representation of the exact integral. Okay? And so you can refine that always, put more points, and get a better precision about the energy. We don't necessarily need to use Monte Carlo, but it's another it's a method. I mean, the Monte Carlo, so it's an integration. So to get the expectation value, you need to make an integration of phi h phi. I know, but okay. So how do you do that? Sometimes it's possible analytically. For example, if it's okay, possible. I mean, if we choose, and so to, so the two points that I was making are kind of connected. If we choose a trial wave function that is simple. Indeed, you might come with something that you can solve analytically. But still, I mean, even that, because of the complexity of the Hamiltonian, remember that you have to solve this. This might be a bit complicated analytically. Okay? So, you know, computing this at a given place is something that's kind of easy, you know. Doing that analytically, that's uh, a different thing, okay? So this is why if you do the integral by a Monte Carlo technique by, you know, sampling the space and getting the, the, the value by, you know, you can densify the grid or increase, increase the number. I'm not an expert in Monte Carlo, I must say, but uh, so by sampling this, this uh, the space as much as possible, there are techniques to, to do that, you can get a sense of what the energy is, okay? And in principle, you can, you know, in, in Monte Carlo, you, there, is, there, there is a narrow bar. So by increasing the number of sampling points that you take, you decrease this error bar, okay? Okay, so if you want to do this kind of things, you need to have a representation of the wave function in real space, okay? And remember that it's not, you know, the function the, that we're speaking about is a many body wave function. So it depends on the position of all the electrons, okay? So that means that if we want to represent in a computer, say, the wave function associated to the oxygen atom, which is eight electrons, okay? And let's say to make it simple that we want to represent the wave function on a 10 by 10 by 10 uh, real space grid, okay? That means <laughs> that we're gonna have to have 10 to the power of 24 real numbers to describe the wave function, okay? Because each single electrons can, oh, you know, as the, 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 the R1, R2, R8 here, okay? So there's three coordinates for each of the Rs. And so we need to have that on this 10 by 10 by 10 grid for each of the R1, R2, up to R8, okay? So that's a very big number already, if you want just to store that, okay? If we compare that to what we are used to in classical mechanics, where if we want to describe these eight electrons, we just need to give their position and their velocities. So that's typically in that case, 48 real numbers that we have. So you see the, the big difference. And so this clearly limits what can be done with such vari variational Monte Carlo methods, okay? So, I mean, you know, there are people doing quantum Monte Carlo calculations and they can then in that case, get the accuracy that they want because as I said, they can you know, increase the sampling. So instead of doing a 10 by 10 by 10, they can do a much denser grid, and then they can sample the space and uh, they can reduce their error bar, okay? But usually these kind of methods are more for systems that have a limited size, okay? Though, I mean, in the last few decades, there's been improvement with respect to that, but again, they have to play also with the form of the wave function that they have. Okay, so, you know, each of the methods that exist to solve this, this problem has its own uh, uh, drawbacks. And in quantum Monte Carlo, one of the drawbacks is the size of the representation, the quality of the wave function that you use to represent 
uh, the, the actual wave function. Okay? Okay, so this is why, because we don't like having to deal with this many body wave function, okay? Usually the methods that are used are to try to go in the direction of the so-called one particle approximations. And the idea, as I was mentioning, is that this term here, so the interaction between the electron is really the annoying term. Indeed, if we say as an assumption that that term is negligible and we get rid of it, okay, then it makes things very simple. Because in that case, we have a system of non-interacting electrons. So each of them is interacting with the potential that is due to the nuclei, but they are not interacting among themselves. And as a result, we can make a separation of the problem. So we can write the wave, the many body wave function as a product of one particle wave function. So the wave function psi that depends on R1 up to Rn is just the product of phi1 R1 up to phi n Rn, okay? And in that case, each of the phi can be found as the solution of a one particle uh, Schrodinger equation. So that's the kinetic energy of that electron, the external potential, and then we get the phi, okay? So this is a you know, very easy mathematics. And in that case, the total energy of the system is given as the sum of each individual energy of the particle of the states that are occupied. Okay, and this will make me uh, make a connection with what Simo was uh, showing this morning. So basically, if I have a system of n electron, and so my notation here is that I have n electron, and zero refers to the state. So the zero is the ground state of the system of n electron. Okay, so we're going to have excited states for that. But in the ground state, the energy is simply the sum of the energies of the lowest occupied state. So you see here we have a bunch of occupied states up to En, because we have En particles, we have N particles, and then afterwards all the states are empty. Okay, and so the energy of that system of non-interacting electron is just the sum of the energies of all these particles that start by occupying the lowest energy levels and then uh, uh, climb up in the ladder of energies, okay? So as I was saying, this allows me to make a connection with the photo emission that uh, Imo, uh, uh, what's his first name now? Simo, Simo was, uh, sorry for that. Uh, so Simo uh, was showing me earlier this morning, okay? So these energies that we know are related to the band structure or in the case of a molecule, that's the isolated level of the, the molecules, can be related by photoemission to photoemission in the following way. So as explained by Simo, the photoemission experiment is that I'm shining some uh, ray of photon on my sample. It can be a solid or a molecule. And then because of this uh, photon, coming photon, one of the electron is extracted and he has a certain kinetic energy that I'm going to measure. Okay, and so we go from a system of n electron up to a system of n minus one electron. Okay, and there is energy conservation. And so if I look at what's what was there before and then what's there after, before I had my photon with an energy energy h nu, and I had my system of n electron in their ground state, E and zero here. And after what I have is that I have an electron which has now a kinetic energy, and I have a system of N minus one electron in a given excited states N, because it's not the ground state, okay? And uh, so if we look at these, we can define the binding energy of the electron that is given by the kinetic energy minus the uh, energy of the incoming photon, so if we look at the fact that these two must be equal, then this difference here is equal to the energy of the system of n electron in the ground state minus the energy of the electron, the n minus one system in the excited state n. And if you just look at you know, the picture, because it's just the sum of the energies of each individual particle here, the difference is just this uh, energy that's not there in the case of the system of n minus one particle. Okay, and so as a result, what we are measuring if we make this difference in energy between the kinetic energy and the photon energy, it's just the energy that is needed, is the energy of that level there. 
Okay, so that's a simplified picture of photo emission. If there were no interaction between the electrons, okay, this picture of okay the difference in the energy between the incoming photon and the, the outgoing electron, the kinetic energy is just the energy that was needed to remove the electron. Okay, and so that's the energy of the electron. Yes. Can we go back to your previous slide? Hi. So you say that you're uh, you're on the ground state electron, but these different energy levels are vibrational. No, that's the electronic. Um, it's the electronic energy. So, you so that's you have n electrons on the ground state. The energy that you no, have. the ground state of the n particle system. Okay, so you need to put the first electron. It's going to be at the lowest energy. Okay, then the second. Okay, if we take the spin, the second is going to have the same energy. Okay, and then the third is going to be, you know, now the level that is the lowest is filled. So I cannot put an electron there anymore. I'm going to have to raise my energy. Okay, so you see that while I'm adding electrons, so the first one goes here, second one goes here, the third goes there, the fourth goes there, and so on and so on. So I have to climb. That's what I was saying. I said that you're climbing the energy when you are adding particles. Okay, so when you have n electrons, the highest, you know, the, the last electron is not in the ground state. So we are in an excited state, if you want, of respect to the lowest energy of the electrons. But this configuration here, where you, we have put all the electrons in the lowest energy levels, there's no way to reduce the energy. This is the ground state of the n electron system. Okay, and what happens in Photo in photo emission, because of the photon, he basically takes one of them, okay, and he extracts it. Depending on the energy of the photon, is going to remove some electrons and not the others. Okay, and now you call this excited. It's excited because it's you know if I wanted to take the ground state of the n minus one, I would have to take one of the electron and make it go down there. Okay, and I would have to fill everything, and then there would be one of them that would be left empty. So when you have a certain number of particles, you need to fill first the level that are the lowest in energy. Okay. And then you know you climb and you, you fill all the levels one after the other. Okay, so the ground state of a n minus one would be everything, everything filled except for the last level, which which would be of. Okay, so this is why that's not the lowest energy of my E n minus one electron system. Okay, this is why I call this the excited state n. Okay. Okay, now we have also the inverse photo emission. In the inverse photo emission, we send an electron with a given kinetic energy on a, syst on a given system. This electron gets absorbed, so that means that he, you know, he occupies one of the levels. Okay, if it were the ground state, in this case, the electron would be here. So this is again an excited state, as you can see here. Okay, and usually the energy of the electron is uh, larger than the energy needed to to make it, uh, let's say, stick to the to the material. And so as a result, there is a photon that is emitted. Okay. And again, if you make the energy concentration, so before we have the kinetic energy of the electron plus a system of n electron in their ground state, and after, you know, once we have sent the electron there, we have a system of n plus one electron, not anymore in the ground state, it's an excited state, okay, for the n plus one system. And we also have emitted a photon, a photon sorry. Okay, and if you make the energy difference, you will find the binding energy for that electron, and that's given by the energy of the system of n plus one particle in a given excited state minus E n zero, and that's just basically going to be E n because it's just the energies of all these plus the energy of this one. Okay, so this is the simple uh, one particle picture that we have of systems. Okay, and that connects to experiments. You can always keep that picture in mind, even though it's not perfect as we would see. Okay? And so this is a picture that we would like to go at always. 
Yes. Yes. Uh, I had oh, one question in the previous slide. Uh, not this one. Again, please. So this one uh, in a wave function, you don't uh, take any account for like principle. Yeah. And I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go to that. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, so this is the simplest picture that we have. Okay. So in the simplest picture, you assume that the electrons are non-interacting. Okay. And you can then just separate the, the, the wave function in the way that is written here. And you're perfectly right. This is completely wrong. Okay. So this is why I said that it's a sim very simplified picture. But I mean, you know, when you have that, it's very easy to, to look at this and to connect to his experiments. Okay. Okay. So, you know, to go beyond that, we need to go in the wave function methods. And the points that you are, we're making is exactly this one. So, yeah, actually, sorry, sorry. Um, another way to look at this is indeed to, uh, so again, to solve this Hamiltonian problem that we have. One way inspired by what I just said here, okay, is to make assumptions about the wave functions. So here, see, if that term that is in yellow there was not there, I could make the separation that's there, okay? And I could write that my wave function is a product of wave function, okay? If it were not there, but we all know that it's there. Huh? So one kind of approximation is to work the other way around, is to say, I know that the interaction is there, but I'm going to make the assumption that the wave function is a product of one electron wave function. OK, and if you do that, OK, what you have to do is, as we know, we have this variational principle. So what we want to do is that we want to minimize the energy associated to this wave function, which is a product of wave functions, OK, under the constraint that each of these wave functions are normalized. And so we introduce Lagrange multipliers here. And so we have to, we have to minimize is this wave, is this function f that depends on each of the single wave function phi. And so we have psi h phi, psi, sorry, minus these Lagrange multipliers times the condition that we want to impose, okay? If you do so, you can show that the problem that we have becomes the following. So we have, again, the, the usual kinetic energy term, the external potential, and then we have a sum here of Coulomb operator that basically describe the interaction of one electron with all the other electrons, but himself. You see, there's a difference here. So the electron does not interact with himself. Okay. So this is the Coulomb interaction between a given electron M with the electron N that we are considering. Uh, excuse me, I have a question. Yes. So can we go back to the previous slide? So for the functional F, so is this functional uh, is some kind of the word, it's uh, analog of the action integral in the Lagrangian formalism? It's the analog of what? Sorry. Uh, action integral, which we are using in the Lagrangian formalism for classical system. I think so, yeah. So basically you have the thing that you want to minimize first, okay? And then you have the constraint that you want to impose. This is the typical formulation in Lagrange. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, by the way, and I have the second question. It's uh, about the wave function separation for uh, one electron. Uh, there is still, we have no, the condition of the anti-symmetry as I understood this. Yes. It was already mentioned there and I'm going, going to get to that, okay? So I'm just going okay. through simple steps, okay? So- Okay, okay, thanks. <laughs> If there was no interaction between the electrons, we could separate and say that the wave function is a product of wave functions, okay? If you go the other way around and say, now I have this problem, there is interaction, and I'm making the assumption that the wave function is a product. This, this is, I mean, the, the, the way people dealt with things, huh? okay? And so that was the archery approximation that came out. Well, uh, we know that it's wrong because the wave function must be anti-symmetric and I'll, I will come to that, okay? But so far, if you assume that the wave function is a product, this is what you have to solve, okay? And then- Thanks. Yes, yes. 
people did that. I mean, now it's obvious for you that you have to go beyond that, but people have to go through different approximations to get that. Okay. And so they, uh, if you do so, okay, the eigenvalues that you get there, okay, you can uh, um, basically compute them in using the formula that's here, okay, and this J M N here are basically due to the interaction of the electrons with each other, okay? And in, in this case, the total energy is again a sum of the eigenvalues. So that's very similar to what we had before in the case in which they were completely non-interacting. And the, there is a correction here of minus one half those J and N because there's a, some kind of double counting of uh, the uh, interaction there, okay? So this is simple mathematics. No, no physics. The, the only thing here is you take it from the, the chemistry point of view. So that the idea of these methods is to try to get the best wave function as possible. Because the better the wave function, the closer you're going to get to the minimum. This is the idea. Okay. So first idea. Okay. Let's make it a product of wave function. Okay. So when we do that, you know, maybe you have all seen the R3 approximation in a different way. Because from the solid community, the way we see that is that we define this R3 potential as the interaction of one electron with the complete density here. Okay, so we put the full density and not, uh, we know we, we, in this case, we have what we have just seen is the, the sum over the m different from n. And what we usually do in the solid community is more to introduce this. R2 potential. And the only difference between the two is simply this case here where the M is different from N. And in this case, we you take all the electrons. So in the R3 potential that we know from the solid community, that potential includes an interaction of the electron with itself, which is called self-interaction. Okay. Which is not something again that is physical. There is no interaction of the electron with itself. Okay. okay, and so if you do this, which we are used to in the solid community, in that case, the, uh, the form of the energy is again the sum of the eigen energies of each individual, uh, let's say, electron. And then there's a correction, which is the R3 energy, which is defined in this way. Okay. So this, you see the two things? Now, of course, and this is probably more than you know, uh, this problem, we made it simpler by separating the movement of each of the electrons, say, but still there is some uh, complexity because to get the wave function and to solve the Hamiltonian, we see that we need all the wave functions because the density that's in the R3 potential Okay, you don't know it. So to get the wave functions, I need the R3 potential, but to get the R3 potential, I need the wave function. And so the way we get out of that is to uh, use a self-consistent loop, meaning that we start from a gas density, we compute the R3 potential associated to that density. From this potential, we can get the, R3, uh, the Hamiltonian, we can solve the Hamiltonian, get the wave function. From there, we get the density, and we re-inject the density in the R2 potential, and we loop until we do not see a change in the density. Okay, and this is something that we're going to do even in DFT. This is really something critical: is that the potential that the electrons are seeing depends on all the electrons, and so you need to do that in a self-consistent way. Okay, so we're coming to the problem that we mentioned there. We all know that indeed for electrons, the wave function needs to be anti-symmetric when you uh, exchange two particles. And as a result, rather than just taking a simple product of wave function, you need to take a slater determinant to represent the wave function. So that's one step forward compared to the simple case of the uh, product of wave functions, okay? And you basically can do exactly the same development and when you do that, again, you will have to minimize this wave function with new Lagrange multipliers that apply on these individual wave functions. And if you do so, we now add a new term, 
which is called the K here, what noted K here, which is the exchange operator. So we have the same Coulomb operator that describes the um, interaction of my electron N that I'm looking at with another electron M, which is different from, from it, okay? And then we have this exchange operator, which is you know, purely a quanti quantum, sorry, where basically you see it compared to the term that is above, so there's been an exchange here between this and this, okay? So there's no physical explanation. It's purely quantum, okay? And so we have this new term that appears. And uh, as a result, the eigenvalue for each of the states is also including uh, a term that here that is due to this, uh, to this case. So we have the same term J that we had before. And now there's another term K basically uh, describes uh, this exchange. And again, for the total energy, you sum all the individual energies, and there's a correction that is due to both the Coulomb energy and the part to the exchange energy, okay? And if we want now to make the connection uh, with um, the R3 term that we had before, we can introduce the R3 potential as before, and the exchange potential defined in this way here. And in this case, the two expressions, this one and this one, are exactly the same. Because when you set m equal to n, you will see that the term that appears in the R3 potential is exactly canceled by this term here. Okay. So these two expressions are exactly the same in this case. Okay. There is no self-interaction in this case. The, the price that we have to pay is that we have introduced now an operator that is non-low, okay? So it acts, so when it acts on phi n at r, it requires to have phi n at r prime. Okay, so if we want to link now, it's an easy way to, to connect to what we did before, to the photo emission experiment, when we have a photo emission, so where we remove an electron, what happens is that we just need to remove one column and one line in the uh, slated determinant. So you see that here, I'm moving from n minus one to n plus one in terms of the column. And here I'm moving from n minus one to n plus one in terms of the line. And in this case, you can say that the energy of this level is given by the energy of the system in their ground state okay, of n electrons in their ground state, minus the energy of the n minus one system of electron in their excited state n. So you need to take the expectation values of the Hamiltonian, and that basically defines the energy that you have, okay? And the same when you add one electron, so an inverse photo emission, in that case, you will add one extra column associated to a given excited state n, and then a line associated to a particle n plus one. In that case, the energy is given by the energy of the system of n plus one particle in their excited state n minus the energy of the state of the system of n electron in their ground state. And this is the energy in the end of that system. Okay. So when you apply R3 fog uh, in uh, for molecules, that basically works rather well. And this is why this method has developed in chemistry, because in many cases it works uh, quite well. You see here for this for atoms, but for molecules, it, it's uh, usually uh, giving a, a rather good job. In contrast, when you use that in solids, it's a disaster. You are overestimating the energy, the, the band gap energy uh, for all the, the semiconductors and insulators. Okay, so it's a bit annoying. Now, the people from the chemistry community, they said, okay, so we've seen that when we go from R3 to R3 fog, we are adding some more information and we are improving our wave function. And so they have kept working along those lines of improving the wave function, okay? And so they have different methods to do that. One is called configuration interaction. In this configuration interaction, the idea is to, that you are going to describe the n electron wave function by a linear combination of slated determinants, okay? And these all include 
excited state. So you, you basically take your, you know, your n, uh, your slated determinant with the ground state wave function, and then you change one of the column, one of the line by a wave function associated to one excited state. And you do many of those, and then you do a linear combination of that, okay? And that gives you more degrees of freedom. And so it gives you a wave function that is better than the, the one that you had before, okay? So in the same line of thought, the couple cluster method basically is using uh, an exponential operator to, sorry, an exponential that applies to the excitation operator on the slated determinant. So you have an exponential of an operator that excites the, so that converts basically the slater determinant into an excited state. And when you have this exponential, if you do a Taylor expansion of uh, an exponential, it's gonna be one plus X plus X squared and so on. And so you basically have something that is very similar to the configuration interaction, but expressed in a different way, okay? And finally, you have the approaches that are due to more implicit. The idea there is to try to make a perturbation theory in terms of what was missing. So what is missing when we have taken R3 fog is the correlation, okay? And so basically what you do is that you try to make an expression of between the exact Hamiltonian and the R3 fog approximation, and you use a perturbation theory as a function of this difference. It can be shown that this uh, correlation that is missing does not contribute to the first order. And this is why you probably have heard about MP2 and MP3, there's no MP1, okay? And so basically write the higher order terms in MP2, second order or order three MP3 um, on a basis of doubly excited slate to determine it, okay? So these are the methods from the, let's say the chemistry community. So on our side, we're more, uh, question? Yeah. So these methods all include both ground state and excited state. I mean, um, yeah, you can always study different uh, different states of the system, but uh, so it depends what, what you call the ground state. It's the ground state of the, the global system. So why, what do you call excited states? But, but that's, that's basically the picture that I gave before. So um, see, there is the excited state of the individual particles and there's the excited state of the system, okay? So, I mean, this here, I mean, any of the states here that is not the lowest one can be seen as an excited state, but I'm speaking not about that kind of excited state, I'm speaking about the excited state of the system of a given number of electrons. So if I have here n electrons, you see that I have n electrons, some of them are not in the ground state of the system, but this is still the ground state of the n system of n electrons. Do you understand the, the, the yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so what is slater determinant related? The slater determinant are related to the, the excited state of the n electron system. This is why, this is the picture, that, the, the slide that I was showing before, sorry. Yeah, it's here. You see, this is an excited state because I have removed one column and one line. So basically among all the possible states, there is an empty place in some, okay? So this is not the ground state because the ground state would be the case in which that electron is at the top, you know, it's, the, it's in the last level. And in the same way, I mean, basically that's, um, so my slated determinants are describing this kind of thing. So this one, in which you see the, the electron, the missing electron is here, okay? This is not the ground state of the system of N minus one electron. Correct. So slated determinants are both for ground state, ground state of the no, whole no, 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 I mean, electron. this, I mean, if I take my slater determinant from this system, okay? And I remove, the line associated to this electron and the column associated to that electron, my slater determinant there is describing an excited state of the n minus one system. Okay? And in the same way, if I add one column and one line to my slater determinant, it's the slater determinant associated to n plus one electrons, okay? And if I have put my electron here and not here, it's going to be an excited state and not the ground state for the n plus one system. 
Okay. Is that clear? Correct. I mean, this, are those methods that you were talking about improving the wave function, the copper cluster, molar cluster, and transmit. Basically, you are using combination or somehow superposition of different slated terminals. Yes. Related to different excited. Exactly. Excited states of the N particle system. Okay. Okay. Or n plus one, depends. Okay. <clears throat> yes. In this first part, you are not considering spin or interaction between electrons, right? In, in the beginning. In the beginning, I didn't. Yes. So to make it how simple. do we know that we can only have two electrons per electron? Because I thought this was a. a, a a consequence of considering spin. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is just for the picture. It's not important. I mean, you could have the same picture with one, okay, per state, if you want. It doesn't change anything. Yeah. It's just for the representation that I've put two, because we all know that there's two, but uh, I mean, it doesn't play a role in what I've described here, okay? You just could basically duplicate each of the levels and put one electron per level, okay? This is the picture that we have, okay? Okay. Okay. So we finally arrive to the methods that we like, which is density functional theory. So the idea of uh, density functional theory is based on a, on a number of theorem. There's two theorem actually. So there's first the Hohenberg and Cohn theorem. And so what they did is to uh, demonstrate that the um, if we have an Hamiltonian in which basically uh, there's an external potential Vx, which usually is due to the, uh, the nuclei. Owen Berenko demonstrated that the electronic density of the ground state, which is defined by basically integrating uh, the product psi star psi over all uh, the degrees of the wave function, but one. So you just keep one of the, the, the of the position R that you do not integrate. And so this density defined in this way determines uniquely the external potential modulo constants. Okay, so basically, if there is a potential, there's a density, and if there is a density, there's a potential. Okay, up to one. Okay, this is the theorem that they, they showed. So before, I don't know if you have seen this theorem, but I'm going to go quickly through them. So before demonstrating the actual theorem, there is a lemma. And the lemma says that if we have two potential V1 of R and V2 of R, the ground state wave function, which can be degenerate or not, um, one of those wave function cannot be, so there does not exist one wave function psi, this is common to both, except if the two potential differ only by one shift. Okay, there's a, a tiny subtility there. They can also be identical everywhere except at points of zero density, but this is uh, very mathematics. Let's let's stick to the to the case that so if the two potential v1 and v2 are different by something else than just a constant, they cannot have the same wave function that is an eigenfunction. Okay, and so how do you prove that? Is that basically you write let's say that if there were um, such a wave function psi that would be common to both of them, okay? You have H1 psi, so where H1 is the Hamiltonian associated to V1. Uh, so H1 psi is equal to a given energy E1 psi. And then we have H2 psi is equal to a given energy, uh, so equal to another energy E2 and then psi. If you make the difference between these two equations, okay? You have a difference of the potential plus the difference in the energy, times the wave function is equal to zero. And this should be true anywhere, okay? If it were true that there exists a wave function that is common to both Hamiltonians. And so if you fix uh, the, the positions uh, of the particles to, up to N and then you integrate, you see that basically uh, you have to have that the difference between the two potential must be constant in space. Okay. So if you have such a wave function, psi, that is such that it's common to both Hamiltonian, okay, you can write mathematically that you need to have this, okay, and if you say, okay, now if 
my uh, psi is, is so if I take R2 fixed up to Rn fixed, now I can see that, so all the differences being uh, this defined for R2 up to Rn, I'm left with one difference here, V1 R1 minus V2 R1, I have all the other potentials that are fixed and that can enter into a constant, okay? And then I have this psi here that only depends on R. And so it means that whatever the difference between the potential, I need to have V1 R1 minus V2 R2 plus a given constant times psi of, that only depends on R1 is zero. And that must be the case everywhere. So that's only possible if these two potential have a constant of difference between the two. Okay, so this is the lemma. If I have two uh, different potentials, the, um, the corresponding Hamiltonian cannot have a wave function that is common as an eigenfunction. Okay, otherwise that means that the two potentials are just shifted by a constant. Okay. Okay, so now that we have that, let's take a first wave function psi one, which is the ground state of the first Hamiltonian associated to one. And then we have psi two, which is the wave function associated to the ground state of the Hamiltonian, which is connected to the potential V2. And we define the energy E1, which is the expectation value of psi one, HV1, psi one, and E2, which is psi two, HV2, psi two. We know that we have a variational principle for both of the systems, so for the system V1 and for the system V2. If we look at the variational principle for the system V1, we can write that the energy of the ground state must be smaller than the energy of the state that would be given by the wave function Psi2. So this is, a, if I choose Psi2 and I take the expectation value, it must be bigger than the one of the ground state, and it must be strictly bigger than that one. So it cannot be an equal because Psi2 is different from Psi1 because of the lemma that we've seen before, okay? Okay, so now if I play a bit uh, with, with the, the, this, this term here, the Psi2, HV1, Psi2, I can write it as, so basically I'm rewriting this HV1 as HV2, plus HV1 minus HV2. And so I can write that this is gonna be Psi2, HV2, Psi2, plus Psi2, the difference between the Hamiltonians, Psi2. So this is nothing but E2. And this difference here is just translated into the difference in the potentials, okay? So this equation there gives E1 is smaller than E2 plus this difference here. And if I had done the same thing, but using the variational principle, not for uh, V1, but for V2, I could have written the exact same equation, changing two and one. So E1 becomes E2, E2 becomes E1, the two becomes one, the two becomes one, and the two becomes one. And basically this is what I would have got, okay? Now, if you sum these two equations, okay, you will see that you have E1 plus E2 on the other side, E1 plus E2, so I can remove the E1 plus E2 on both sides. So I have zero plus, and then I have this, this term here, V1 minus V2 times N2, V2 minus V1 times N1, which I can write as V2 minus V1 times N1 minus N2, okay? And so you see that here, if the uh, two density, um, if the two densities were the same, in that case, we would have zero smaller than zero, which is obviously wrong, okay? So if you have two different potentials, the density must be different at least in one point in space, okay? So basically, this shows that if you have a given potential, there is one density associated to it, to it at a shift of the potential, you know, modular shift uh, of the potential, okay? So this proves that indeed, once the ground state that density is known, the external potential is defined up to a constant. And so what we usually do is that we are going to fix that constant by saying, for instance, that uh, the potential goes to zero. And as a result of that, 
we can say that the external potential is a functional of the density. So it depends, it can be obtained from density. Once you know the density, you know the potential. And then all the other quantities that are related to the potential can be derived from that same density. And this is why we call that density functional theory. Okay. And in particular, if we look at the total energy, which is uh, uh, psi h psi, it can be written as a functional of the density. And this is a, an exact result. There is no information in that. So this Cohen-Bering Cohen theorem proves that there exists a functional of the density that can give exactly the total energy. Okay. The problem is that we don't know it. Okay, it exists, but we don't know it. Okay, so in again looking back at history. The way people worked at that in the beginning was to try to get an expression for that total energy functional. So people came with an energy functional for the kinetic energy. So for instance, you have the Thomas Fermi version of the kinetic energy that just depends on the density. Okay, And even nowadays, that are, uh, there are some methods that are called um, orbital free methods in which the idea is really to get to a functional of the density, so an analytic expression for the density that provides you the energy, okay? So how do we get uh, to do that? So the idea is that in principle, as I said uh, at the very beginning, we want to minimize, so here, here I'm assuming that my, uh, uh, my wave function phi are normalized, and so I can write the energy in this way, so it's uh, uh, phi, uh, H phi, and so I need to minimize that to obtain the ground state. Now, thanks to the fact that for a given density, there's um, a unique uh, Hamiltonian associated to that, I can minimize this expression with respect to the density and then minimize respect to the density, okay? And so as a result, if I decompose my Hamiltonian pieces, I have the kinetic energy, the electron-electron interaction, and then I have the interaction of each of the electrons with the external potential and the next. And as a result, you can split the pieces into this term here, which is the kinetic energy plus the electron-electron uh, interaction that really requires to resort to the wave function. And then we have a term here that's basically the density times the external potential. So for this term here, we don't need to know explicitly the wave functions. So when you see that, uh, we can write that the energy is just uh, the minimization over the density of a given functional of density, which is this piece here, plus this term here. So this, again, is a universal function of the density, but it is not known explicitly. And as I was mentioning, people try to get that, but it is a big chunk, a big part of the energy. And so usually the approximations that were made were not satisfactory enough because you know you were making big mistakes on this on such an approximation. So people try to come with the idea to split that uh, f of n into pieces that they know that should resemble something. Okay, and so they remove that in such a way to remain with something which was rather small and could be reasonably approximated. So what are the pieces that uh, can be connected with? The first one is to say that try to relate to a system of non-interacting electrons. For that one, the kinetic, kinetic energy is a known functional of the density. For non-interacting electrons, this is something that can be computed. Furthermore, from what we've seen before, we know that there must be something that looks like the R3 energy. So we may as well remove that contribution from the total energy. So as a result, we can say that this F of N, which we don't know, and it's a big chunk, we remove things that we know from there. We remove the energy of the non-interacting, the kinetic energy of the non-interacting electrons, and we remove the R3 energy. So we are left with something which is way smaller, and this is what includes the exchange that we know must be there, okay? And there must be correlation. And so we call that the exchange correlation energy. So rather than trying to get an, you know, uh, an approximation for the global formula, we just split that into pieces. And the only approximation that we need to make now is, sorry, 
the only approximation they need to make is about this exchange correlation energy, okay? And so as we will see, it's easier to make a reasonable approximation for that. And for the moment now, we're gonna assume that this functional is known. So we know this EX. Okay. So the total energy, as we said, is um, now an expression uh, functional of the density. It includes the kinetic energy of the non-interacting electrons. It includes the interaction with the external potential. It includes the R3 term, and it includes this functional EX of N. And we want to minimize that because in the ground state, the energy is the smallest there. And we want to minimize that and the constraint that the integral of the density over the whole system must give the number of electrons that we have in the system. And so there again, we introduce Lagrange multipliers, okay? And we do a functional a derivative to show that this um, expression of the energy minus the Lagrange multipliers uh, multiplying the condition over the density gives us zero so that we are in a minimum. And when you derive this expression in a functional way, you will get this term here, then we get the external potential, you will recover the R3 potential, and then there is this term here equal to lambda, and this can be seen as a, a, an Hamiltonian, a one electron Hamiltonian, uh, where the potential in which the electrons are interacting is the so-called Cohn-Sham potential that basically includes the terms that are here. So the external potential, the R3 potential, this derivative of the exchange correlation energy, which we are going to call the exchange correlation potential here. Okay, so we recover this Cohn-Sham potential, which includes the external potential, the R3 potential, and the exchange correlation potential. Okay, and so we need to solve the... Uh, one electron uh, Hamiltonian equation here, where we have this new potential, which is the so-called potential. potential. Okay? And that basically is very similar to what was done before. We are back to a one electron formalism in which the electrons are not interacting. Okay? I mean, their interaction, of course, is integrated in this term, in these two terms here. Okay, and so the density is simply given by the sum of the square modulus of the, um, the wave functions for all the occupied states. And so by construction, when we, yeah, of course, again, this needs to be solved consistently because as you see, I mean, to get the wave function, you need the constant potential, but to get the constant potential, you need the density. And so to get the density, you need the wave function. So you, this is why, again, this needs to be solved consistently, starting from a given density, you obtain the Cohn-Sham potential, you solve, you obtain the wave function, and from there, you recompute the new Cohn-Sham uh, potential. And once you achieve self-consistency, uh, self sorry, the electronic density must be the one of the ground state, okay? And if we have the exact exchange correlation functional, in that case, it's really the exact ground state of the system, and the total energy must be minimal. Now, we often look, and probably many of you have computed the uh, have a look at these eigenvalues here of the Hamiltonian uh, of the one particle wave function, just to remind you that these wave functions that we have and the eigenvalues that we have are those of a fictitious set of independent electrons, they are not those of the real ones. They do not correspond in principle to any exact quantity. We'll see that there are some exceptions, but in practice, they are not the, the you know, they're just Lagrange multipliers, the eigen energies, okay? Now, the solution of the cohn champs consistent system of equation is equivalent to minimizing this functional here of all the wave functions. So we have the kinetic energy, the ex external potential, the R3 energy, and the exchange correlation energy. And we need to minimize that under the constraint that the wave functions are orthonormal. Okay, so we have still a big problem, which is the fact that the exchange correlation is unknown. And so one of the nice things of the paper of Cohn and Sham, which made the success of the paper, was that they also came up with a reasonable approximation for this exchange correlation function. So how does it work? 
So they first uh, still used a general expression, which is always valid. So they said that the exchange correlation functional can be written as an integral over the density times a density of exchange correlation function of exchange correlation, sorry. And this exchange, uh, the density of exchange correlation depends on the position, but it depends also on the density everywhere, okay? And so they made the approximation that, in fact, they, did, they said, okay, let's assume that the this exchange energy per electron is depending only on the density at the point that I'm considering, not on the density everywhere. And furthermore, they said, let's say that it's equal to that of an homogeneous electron gas with the same density. And so they could obtain, so they said, okay, this expression here in the LDA that depends on R and N just at the position of R. And they take it to be the one of the homogeneous electric gas. For the exchange part, it can be computed analytically. You have the expression here. And for the correlation part, this is done by using numerical uh, methods such as the quantum Monte Carlo that we were mentioning at the beginning. And this works quite well. Just to give an example, uh, I'm comparing here uh, the results, I'm going to show you the results for Afnon and Zircon. So Zircon, maybe you, some of you know it, it's something that you put in jewelry to replace a diamond. It's a cheaper version of, of diamond that looks a bit like, like diamond, say. And Afnon is the equivalent of Zircon, where you replace the zirconium by Afnion. So typically, it's a body-centered tetragonal system. You have two formula units of MSiO4 in the unit cell. And you can see that it's alternating SiO4. So if you look along the C-axis, you have this SiO4, which, has, which are the tetrahedra in gray, and then the MO8 units that are uh, those uh, octahedra, uh, sorry, yeah, polyhedra that you have there, okay? In these MO8 units, you have four oxygen atoms at, at the corner, uh, sorry, eight oxygen atoms in the corner. Four of those are closer to the zirconium, and four of the ones are a bit longer, uh, further away. And each of the oxygen atoms is three, four coordinates. If you look at the uh, relaxed structure that you obtain, the lattice parameters that you obtain uh, when you, you do uh, the theoretical DFT calculation within LDA, you see that the agreement is very good. We typically have one, two percent error on the lattice parameters. The angles are very good. So the volume is very good. So you know this is really nice to make predictions. This is why LDA was um, well used quite a lot in the beginning. Obviously, it has some problems, and uh, people have tried to go uh, and try always try to go beyond the LDA. One of the known problems, for instance, is the hydrogen bond. Uh, which is not well described uh, at all with an LDA. So one of the methods was to go uh, beyond the fact that the, um, the density of uh, exchange correlation energy depends on the density at the point N at the point R by using also a dependence on the first gradient, the second gradient, and so on. This is so-called a generalized gradient approximation. In this case, there is no model. Uh, such as the homogeneous electron gas for which there is an analytic expression, but still people have come up with analytic expression that do not correspond to any model, but they try to, to obtain uh, uh, models that satisfy a number of rules about the system. And there exists a wide variety of GGA. So you probably all know PBE, so for Purdue, Burke, and Eisenhower. But before that, in the 80s, there were a Purdue 186, then Purdue 191. And you know, basically every day, there were, not every day, but every year, let's say, there were a few uh, functionals coming out. Then there is another kind of, uh, of uh, functionals that um, appeared, I would say, in the last uh, 15 years or 20 years or so. These try to include the fact that we know that there is exchange in there, and let's they try to um, devise a way to write the exchange potential uh, from the R3 fog as a functional of the density step. And this approach, oh, sorry, they don't do that. They, 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 they need to take that explicitly as a function of the wave function, and then the derived form that depends on the density. And this approach is referred to as the exact exchange, okay? 
There are some other methods that try to suppress the self-interaction that we've seen here. That we know is, is not supposed to be there. And then, you know, those that are now uh, very uh, widely used, that they are uh, more demanding because this exact exchange is hard to compute, are the so-called hybrid functional that mix a bit of exact exchange with the usual functionals that we before. Okay. So you probably all know HSE. If you have done some calculations. Okay, so this is a uh, just a paper about the importance of DFT. So this is a, a paper that is kind of old, it's from 2003, where you would see the 10 paper that were cited more than 1,000 times. So uh, you will see that now they are cited way more than that uh, at the time. And you see that those, all the paper that were cited a lot, you had Kohn Sham, Owen Berg and Kohn, this one about the, um, self-interaction correction, this one about the electron gas, and then some of the methods related to uh, PFT. Uh, this is a more recent paper, 2014. In that paper, you have a top uh, 100 of the paper who cited. So here, what they did is they created, uh, they put each of the first pages of all published papers, okay? And you put them one on top of the other. And when you do that, you see that you almost reach the eight of the, so which is that? Yeah, it's uh, more than 5,000 meters of papers. So you just stack one sheet of paper on top of the other, okay? And what is kind of bad is that- uh, I didn't know. I didn't know that was only the first page. I thought they were the whole article. No, no, no. It's, it's only the first page. It's only the first page. Only the first page. <laughs> it's only the first page. So that means that 90% uh, of the articles are not cited by anyone, not even by the... No, 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 no. So it's 2,500 here that's not cited. That's the lower... Not point. even by the same one. Yeah. Zero citation here. <laughs> you see you have the Eiffel Tower here. This one is... Yes. Then uh, you see that you have those that are cited between zero and 10 times and you arrive here. Then, so if you have a paper that's cited more than 10 times, you're doing quite well because you're in the upper part. And then if you reach more than a hundred times, you know, it's very, very good. So if you look at those that at the very top, the last uh, few meters or centimeters of the, uh, probably centimeters of this uh, mountain paper, uh, you can see that all these papers are about DFT and many of those actually, ah, uh, sorry. So that I highlighted them. Many of those are related to functionals. So L, the first one, LYP is a functional, BEC is a functional, PP16 is a functional, BEC is functional again, then you have Concham or Bercon, then you have VASP, then you have the Moncourse part uh, sampling, then VASP again, then something related to VASP, then VASP again, then functional and then functional. Okay, so you see that all those papers are cited like uh, crazy in particular the, the first ones. Some of them are cited more. So, you, so for instance, the first one, if you, you combine together the first and the, so seven and eight so the, at the top there, uh, this is blip functional that was used quite a lot. B3 lip functional, for instance, that were used quite a lot in chemistry. Okay, so, you know, this whole, uh, Tutorial is also about the fact that, as you probably know, there's a problem with DFT, which is the fact that it systematically underestimates the band, band gap by 30, 50 percent, or even sometimes 100 percent. And as I will show you, this uh, problem is related to the existence of a discontinuity in the derivative of the exchange correlation. So, so when you see the band gap, you really say you really mean take the uh, Kohn-Sham eigenenergies. Yeah. So if you take the Kohn-Sham eigenenergies, okay, of the last occupied and the first unoccupied, and you make the difference between the two, okay. So these are supposed to be um, Lagrange multipliers, okay. But still, we like to use them yeah, yeah. and to 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 actually because actually the last one and the first one occupied have a, have a physical meaning. It has been proven actually. Okay. Uh, but so still, if you use them, there's a problem. Okay, it's underestimated. And uh, it's as you see here, it's systematically underestimated. You know, we are R34 to us 
systematically overestimating, and now we have something that is systematically underestimating. So no surprise when we do the hybrids, which mix a bit of overestimation with a bit of underestimation, you can get something that is pretty much online. Okay. Okay. So. Um, so if we come back to the definition that we had of the photo emission, if you remember uh, what I said is um, that the, the, the bandwidth, <laughs> as I will show, can be related to some kind of excitation in the system. So we first define the electron affinity, which is the smallest amount of energy that you need to add one electron to the system. So that's the energy of the system of n plus one electrons in their ground state here, minus the energy of the system of an electron in the ground state. So this is the minimum energy that you need to go, from, sorry, that you need to go from n, plus, uh, from n to n plus one, okay? So you are in the ground state when you have n, in the ground state when you have n plus one. That's the minimum energy. In the same way, we define the ionization energy as the minimum energy that is needed to go from n to n minus one, okay? And again, it's the energy of the system of n electron in the ground state minus the energy of the system of n minus one electron in the ground state. And we define the quantity Eg, which is the difference between the electron affinity and the ionization energy. So it's written as it's written here, basically. And so you see that it's En plus one zero plus En minus one zero minus twice En zero, okay? So this quantity is positive, let me show. In the case of atomic and molecular clusters, uh, you can have, you, you always have that the ionization energy, which is actually the energy of the OMO, is strictly smaller than the electron affinity, which is the energy of the LUMO. <laughs> but in a solid, we define the chemical potential, which uh, satisfies the relation that is here. We have the ionization energy, uh, smaller or equal to mu, smaller or equal to Ea. And if we take the thermodynamic limit, meaning that the number of particles and the volume go to infinity while keeping constant the ratio between n and d, we can distinguish the metallic systems in which we have a zero gap. So basically, we have that the ionization energy is equal to mu, which is equal to Ea, and an insulating system in which the gap is bigger than zero, and so we have that the ionization energy is strictly smaller than mu, which is strictly smaller than mu. Okay, so now just to give a few words about this. Uh, yeah, can I have a question? Yeah, sure. The last one. Yes, uh, I'm interested about this chemical potential expression. Can we give some exact values for chemical potential for DFT? No, it's somewhere between the two. Okay. So usually we put it at, sorry. Yes, actually, we usually put it at the top of the Venus band, but uh, I mean, unless you start looking at the defect system, in that case, you can come up with uh, so if you can compute the energy for uh, a system with defects, in that case, by playing with the density of defects and concentrations, so on there is a way to get uh, um, um, a value for the chemical potential. So, so we can get some uh, good good values from, from the metallic system, but for others, I see here it's like uh, approximately equal to the ionization energy. But I mean, you always need a reference, even in the case of the metallic system. Okay, okay. you will need to put some vacuum if you want to have where is the, the Fermi lab, the, 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 yeah, the chemical potential. Okay. Thank you. Can I? Yeah. I have a question about hybrid functions. Mm -hmm. When we calculate the ex exact exchange term uh, in DFT, we consider the orbitals for the Cauchian orbitals, right? Mm -hmm. But this final value of this exchange uh, energy with the Cauchian orbitals or with the hot report orbitals, are they hugely different or? Um, because I'm considering now interactions between the electrons. So, so just to, just to to make sure that I understand correctly what you mean. So you said that you want to compare the the R three fog wave functions with the wave functions that are obtained with an hybrid functional. Only 
the energy, the, the exchange energy, mm -hmm. because when we calculate with hybrid functionals, we are considering the whole orbitals, the constant orbitals, mm -hmm. but in Hutterford, we consider this, ex this exchange energy only considering the Hutterford orbitals. Yeah. But uh, when I calculate these using hybrid functionals and using the orbitals from the, the constant orbitals, is this more exact and it's calculated in the same way? Or I mean, in a real system, I mean, the real system is not hard to fuck. So what is, what is exact exchange? The exact exchange would be the exchange that you have in the real system. So I would tend to say that those that are the, the wave functions that are the results of the hybrid functional are closer. I mean, you, you would need to, you see what I mean? Yes. Is this also sold self-consistently no. in the, when you're no, it's in not the calculation? Different. No, because I mean, the, the hybrids, so some people play with the parameters, the amount of uh, exact exchange that you put, how you define that. I mean, there are methods to do things in connection with GW also, because it, it, there's a way to show that this, uh, the, the parameter alpha that enters there is related to the screening. And so some people have uh, demonstrated ways to, to deal with that, but that's very demanding. So nobody does that. Uh, in Yes. Another question about steel hybrid functions. You know that some hybrid functions are more used for molecules, like for example, B3, LYP. I know that is very used, for example, in Gaussian codes, while HSC is more for material semiconducting. Uh, what makes a hybrid functional more suited for a molecule or for a solid? Is there like I would say that it's purely empirical. So for okay. instance, the B3 lip, the tree means there are three parameters mm -hmm. to define the, the, the fitting there. And I think this is just based on the, yeah, on, on comparing data. And so the three parameters are defined by fitting. There's actually a paper that has appeared from Miguel Marquez, I don't know if, uh, if you've seen that. It's about, uh, so they, you know, each of the functionals that we have, they have their parameters. And so they use machine learning okay. to try to get better parameters there and show what you can get best. So yeah, because I mean, there is, you know, that there's no exact expression. And so people have to play with different ways. And so they, they try things and uh, yeah. I mean, you can see there are some, some of the, and this maybe answers a part of your question. As I was mentioning, the alpha parameter that you have in the, the, the hybrid is related to the screening that you have, mm -hmm. which doesn't make real sense for molecules. And this may explain why for molecules that. Okay. okay, so to understand a bit more the, the origin of the discrepancy between the gaps that we have in D and the and um, yeah, the experiments. Uh, one way to look at that is to extend the, the DFT in a range where you have non-integer number of electrons, so 3.5 electrons, 3.6 electrons, and so on. How do we do that? So we define that by using ensemble averages. So meaning that so the density for 3.5, for instance, would be something linear between the density of the system of three electrons and the system of uh, four electrons, and the delta would be one half in this case. Okay, so you have let's define it this way, and the energy is defined in that way. Okay, from this definition, you can see that the ionization energy is the derivative of the energy uh, respect to the number of electrons when you take it from the left, whereas the electron affinity is the derivative when you take it from the right. Okay. And so the, the gap, the fact that there is a difference between these two is actually related to the existence of a discontinuity in the derivative of the energy, okay? And it can be shown that it comes from the exchange correlation potential. And so basically, if you, basically what, what we're doing when we you know, generalize DFT for um, this uh, fractional number of electrons is that you are interpolating between N minus one and N, so for instance, three and four, and then four and five. So you see that you have this linear interpolation, and this can be shown to be, this is the exact way to do things, okay? 
Now, what happens when we use a typical LDA or DGA is that we have something which is continuous with respect to the fractional number of electrons, and that's it's smooth. And we are we have um, some uh, uh, convexity that goes in the direction here. Okay, or I don't know if it's a it's a concavity in this case. Okay, whereas when we take the R3 fog, it's just the other way around. So the it's the convexity in this case. Okay, and so with no surprise again, if you manage to make a mixture of the two, you get closer to the straight lines. Okay. Okay, so this is for the theory. I don't know how, how am I doing with time. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to start, and maybe this afternoon uh, uh, we'll uh, we we'll continue. Okay. So how is all that implemented in Abinit? First, maybe a few words about Abinit. Uh, those who don't know it, so it's a package that can do DFT calculation using pseudo potential and plane waves. So we focus focusing on uh, on solids. It allows you to optimize the geometries, but it also, as we will see on Thursday, then uh, it allows you to compute the excited states within many body perturbation theory, more precisely using the GW and the beta phase equation. Uh, so it's released under the GNU public license, and so it favors development and collaboration. So the first thing that you will have to do is to describe the structure of the system that you want to investigate. And so, as you know, in the system, in solids, uh, the crystal is uh, uh, something which is repeated with a regular pattern. And so you have a unit cell that is repeated in a three-directional space. So what you want to do is to describe the primitive unit cell, in such a way that if you have the lattice, you can recombine the full crystal. And so to describe the unit cell, you need to provide the three lattice vectors in one, in two, and in three. Just to remind you that basically the nodes of the lattice are given by L times A1 plus N times A2 plus N times A3 with the L and N, which are, which are integers. Just an example, the triclinic system consists in the case in which you have so that's the most uh, you know, non-symmetric system in which you have A1 different from A2 from A3 in terms of their length. And the angles that they form between them, alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three, are all different. In contrast, the cubic system, which is probably the most uh, symmetric, has a one equal to a two equal to a three in terms of the length, and the angles between the vectors uh, are ninety degrees. The other thing that we want to take advantage of is the symmetry of the system. Each of the unit cell itself can have some symmetry inside, so you can define an asymmetric unit cell. Once you apply the symmetry to that asymmetric unit cell, you recover the primitive unit cell, and then thanks to the less parameters, you can get the full crystal. So in a minute, <coughs> how do we describe the three vectors A1, A2, and A3? We describe them thanks to uh, three variables. So you have this one, which is scale card, then you have the R prime. It here, it's good here, R prime, and then uh, a cell. So these kind of define the direction, and then this one and this one are scaling factors. So the first one is scaling each of the direction, whereas the other one is scaling the uh, Cartesian coordinates. So for instance, if you want to use a face centered orthorhombic, so orthorhombic means that the three length of A1, A2, and A3 are different. Okay? The easiest way to do so, if you have an FCC, not FCC, but FCO system, in that case, it's nice to use something which is similar to FCC, meaning that the R prime is 0, 1 half, 1 half, 1 half, 0, 1 half, 1 half, 1 half, 0, and then use the scale card to show that the three directions are different. In this case, we have 9.5, 9.8 and 10 for the three different dimensions. Okay. In an hexagonal system, what we have is that uh, we can write the first two vectors as a, a square root of three divided by two, and then one half zero minus square root of three divided by two, one half zero, and then zero, zero, one. Okay. And multiply that. So we multiply in this case, not the line, but we multiply the column. So the first column would be multiplied by this one. 
and the second column will be multiplied by this one, and the last column will be multiplied by this one. Okay, so this is one way to define the structure. There's another way which consists in saying, okay, I'm going to give the uh, lengths and the angles. So I'm giving uh, 9.5, 9.5, 10 for the same example here, and then 120 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees. So for these two, you can choose. In the case of a trigonal system, it's way easier to use this notation here because the trigonal system is a case in which the three lengths are the same and the three angles are the same, but are not equal to 90 degrees. Okay, so it's kind of easy to write it in this way. Then, uh, I've to exploit symmetries as much as possible. And so if we represent the symmetries uh, using the SAIDS notation, so in the SAIDS notation, basically each of the symmetry operation consists of a matrix that describes the uh, rotation here. It's a uh, question. Yeah. If, if, if uh, the, uh, the system requires always to give it the crystal, uh, crystal structure, but can I give just to the Cartesian coordinate of the average? Yeah, I'm going to go to that. Okay. Just be patient. I, yeah. I will come to that. So for the moment, I'm just describing the lattice, okay, oh. and the symmetry. So if you want to specify the symmetry yourself and force the symmetry, one way to do so is to give each of the symmetry operation of the system that you want to enforce. So you need to specify the rotation and the name of the variables. So you have the brown here that refers to a name of an input variable in ability is simrel. So that's this uh, rotation here. And then you have the translation, which are labeled T nonce here, okay? So this is for the screw symmetry operation or for the glide planes that you have in some of the system. And remember that this vector here needs to be smaller than a primitive unit cell. So typically when you have um, one element of symmetry noted by the SAIDS notation applied to the position of some atom tau k here, you basically first apply the rotation to the uh, positions and then you translate them by a uh, vector that's the vector associated to the operation and so you get an atom which is equivalent but which may be in a different unit cell so for instance if you have screw axis you can go in the next unit cell if you have a glide plane you can move to another unit cell if you have a mirror plane and you're close to the edge you get to the near nearest unit cell as well okay so you can always get symmetry that brings you in a different unit cell Okay, so we're coming to the points that you're making. So now that we have the lattice vectors, the symmetry, we need to describe the position of the atoms. And first we need to say how many atoms there are in the unit cell. The variable for that is called an atom. Then we can define either the reduced coordinates, so expressed in terms of the lattice vectors, but we can also specify the coordinates, the Cartesian coordinates, either in atomic units, the Bohr's, or in angstroms. And so for each of them, you have uh, one specific variable. It's either this one, X red, the reduced coordinate, either the Cartesian coordinate or the uh, Cartesian and extra. And you need to specify only one of the three. You cannot specify three of them. Okay? So I think that yeah, answers I think that answer part of the question. My question sometimes, I don't know the crystal structure in the uh, point of Google. Yeah. yeah, so, so that's, I'm uh, coming to that as well. Yeah. Okay? So the other thing that you need to specify is which atom is which. What is their type? So they can be silicon, they can be oxygen. Yes. Yes. Uh, one question about what is the maximum number of atoms in a primitive can be calculated in a happiness? I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, you can put as many as you want. So I... Because uh, some uh, some 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 other program cannot. Uh, Calculate for the big system, uh, apply a quantum espresso or something like that. Yeah. There, there's no limitation in quantum espresso either. I don't understand the point. What, what would be the limit? The, the limit that is the time. Is Apart the from the CPU time and the memory that you have on your computer? Yes. Yeah, this is the limit. So the code in itself doesn't have any limits. Do, do I understand correctly? Yes, I, I understand. So the main limitation is, you know, how much can I fit in my computer? If it's a small computer, you're limited, but um, otherwise the program, they don't have an intrinsic limit on the number of atoms. 
I don't think it's the case in quantum espresso either. Eh? Okay. Okay, so we need to specify the type of the atoms. Maybe we can discuss further because I'm, I'm not sure that I got your point. But uh, okay. and then indeed there's there's two options. Okay, one is if you know the space group. Sometimes you know. Okay, uh, in the case of Afnan and Zirkon that I was showing before, the space group is defined, and so in the input you can specify the space group. You say space group so and so. Okay, in that case you don't even need to specify all the atoms. You can just specify those that are in the asymmetric unit cell. Okay, and this is why you need to specify here the number of atoms in the reduced uh, cell. Okay, it's not in the full cell. You can specify the number of symmetries, and then you can specify the symmetry operation, trying to do the similar and genomes. But if you don't know the space group, the code will find it for you. Okay, as an example, this is uh, zirconia. Okay, in cubic zirconia. Uh, so that's an FCC system. So you see the space group is F n minus three n. Okay, we have the lattice parameters, uh, 5.01 angstroms, and we have angles of uh, 90 degrees. So the zirconium are occupied, occupying the weak of position 4a, which means that if you take a conventional unit cell, you're going to get one atom in 0, 0, 0, and then you have all the equivalent ones in the center of the faces. Okay. In the zirconia, uh, sorry, in the, the oxygen atoms, there's one here in one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, and then you have eight equivalent actually oxygen that are occupying the different sites there. Okay, so in Abinit, we focus, right, if I choose to work with the primitive cell, it's an FCC. So the primitive cell is again for the R prime is to use zero, one half, one half, one half, zero, one half, and then one half, one half, zero. I can specify the lattice parameters. So 5.01, 5.01, 5.01. The default unit is atomic unit in a minute, but you can specify angstrom by just adding angst at the end of the line. Okay. Then in this case, in my unit cell, I have one zirconium atom that's going to be my type one. And then I have two oxygen atoms, which are going to be type two and type two. Okay. And so the first atom is going to be in zero, zero, zero. That's this one. And then the first oxygen is in one fourth, one fourth, one fourth. And the second oxygen is in minus one fourth, minus one fourth, minus one fourth. So I have three atoms in the end. Okay. So when I enter that into a minute, it will discover, if you look at the output file, it will tell you that the space group is F M minus three M. So always check that the output is what you expected. If you know the space group in advance. Okay. And it tells you that the space group is 2.25. It's going to give you all the symmetry operation. So you can have a look at those. And so you can see, for instance, that this one here is an inversion. So that basically brings this atoms here. Okay. And then some other here is a mirror plane. So you can look at all of those. Okay. You can decide to do things slightly differently. You change your input file from the beginning. If you know what the space group is, you can say, my space group is 225. And I only have two atoms in the reduced unit cell. The first one, which is the zirconium, and the second one, which is the position that I was mentioning for the oxygen atoms. Okay, so you have uh, quite a lot of flexibility. Okay, so if we take the silicon, uh, silicon is uh, a space group FD minus 3M. So in this case, we have a different lattice vector, uh, lattice parameter, sorry, but it's the same kind of cubic system. So in this case, we have two atoms in the unit cell. We specify the lens again, the zero, one half, one half, one half, zero, one half, and one half, one half, zero. In this case, we have one only one type of atoms. There's two of them, one located in one eight, one eight, one eight, and the other one in seven eight, seven eight, seven eight. So basically, that's these eight a week of positions. And again, the code is going to find that it's same, the, the good space group at d minus three m space group two to seven, and in this case. In contrast with previous case where uh, basically you see that all the symmetries right here, all the symmetries are just specified by Simrel. There is no translation because this is a symorphic group. In the case of diamond, it's a non-symorphic group. And in that case, you have some of the operation that are screw axis or glide planes. And you see that there are non-zero here translation to us associated to some of the symmetries. Okay, so this is to specify the initial. Second thing is, 
how do we represent the wave function? Should I stop here, maybe? Depends on uh, if you can afterwards, once we are in the other room, or can specify things easily or not. And we, there's a projector there as well. There is a projection there. Okay. Uh, unless you are willing to continue, but uh, have a break. In. How long does it take to end? Say again. I mean, how long do you need to end? Uh, um, it can be fast and depends on how, how you know things. Maybe I can go fast. And then for those who haven't never done DFT, they can ask me a question afterwards in the afternoon. Do you prefer that? Okay, so then I'm gonna go try to go fast. Okay, so the natural basis set for periodic system is plane waves because we have a block theorem that gives says that the uh, wave function is expressed by uh, a plane wave times a function that has the periodicity of the system. And so if we define the reciprocal lattice by this function here, we can write the periodic part as a sum of coefficient times plane waves uh, that are the, um, uh, the, the nodes of the lattice, the reciprocal lattice. So as a result, the wave function can be expressed as a sum of these coefficients and the plane wave depends both on K and the vectors that we are considering here. So uh, despite the fact that it's a periodic code, we can deal with molecules and surfaces and point defect by using the so-called supercell technique. What the idea is that if I want to represent a molecule, what I do is that I take a big unit cell in which there is enough vacuum in such a way that the molecule does not interact with its repeated images. And so I need to do a convergence as a function of the amount of vacuum that I put in my cell to make sure that there is no interaction and that the results that I get are independent of the amount of vacuum that I've put. The same for a surface. In that case, we have a periodicity in two directions, which is only one here because you don't see the other one. But in the third direction, what I have is that my slab is repeated and I need to put enough vacuum in such a way that this surface does not interact with the that surface. And the same is true for a defect in which I'm repeating the unit cell with a given defect, and I want to have to, to not have any interaction with uh, from, from one defect to the next neighboring cell. So I need to increase the size of my uh, unit cell. Okay, so you need to do a converged cell study in all three cases as a function of your uh, unit cell size. Now, how do we define the size of the basis set? So ideally, we want to. To describe a you know a super precise wave function, of course, because of the few time and so on, we cannot. So we have to stop the description up to a certain level, and we do that through the kinetic energy of the different plane waves. So the kinetic energy is given by the expression that you have here. So basically, we take so which is defined by a parameter which is called cut, and basically you take a sphere and you take all the vectors of the lattice, the reciprocal lattice that are within the sphere. And for all of those, you have a coefficient that is non-zero for describing the wave function. Now, this number of plane waves that enter into uh, the sphere uh, is changing in a non-continuous way as a function of the cutoff energy. Just to show you that, so if I take a given sphere, see that here I have four uh, points or four G vectors in my sphere. So I, if I have, uh, um, sorry, if I have a cutoff, so the cutoff is here, and this is the number of plane waves, you see that if the cutoff is below this threshold here, I have zero point in the circle. And as soon as I reach that one, I have four points in the circle up to the point where I'm gonna reach the next circle that brings that to another uh, eight points more. So that's 12 and then so on and so forth. So you see that the number of vectors that you have in the sphere changes in um, this continuous way. And that's the same when you change the lattice parameter because when you change the lattice parameter, you have the size of your reciprocal lattice that is changing. And so the number of points that enter into the sphere when you change the lattice parameter is going to change uh, discontinuously. And so if you do a plot by uh, fixing the cutoff, and if you do that, and you look, you know, by doing points in for the lattice parameters that are close to one another, you will see this kind of uh, so-tooth uh, shape because you are changing the number of plane waves 
in each of the curve that's here, and you would see the same in the fresh. To avoid that, we use a trick, uh, which is called uh, uh, cutoff smearing. So basically, rather than saying abruptly that the wave functions are changing from, so to the coefficient of the wave function are, are, are changing abruptly from non-zero to zero, we introduce a transition, and there's a region in which we uh, smooth the coefficient of the wave function in such a way that you avoid uh, these kind of problems. And this is called E cut SM. Um, let's see. Yeah, basically, I mean, the, 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 the G vectors, they describe the kind of oscillation that you're able to describe. If you have a strong oscillation, you need to have a large number of plane waves. You need to have a coefficient of the, the, plane, the wave function for the, the plane waves that are big, okay? And so this is a problem because you, we know that the, um, close to the core of the, of the system, the wave functions are oscillating quite a lot. First, the core wave function, they oscillate because you know, they're core wave functions, but then the other ones, even for the valence electrons, they need to be orthogonal to, to those ones. And since they're orthogonal, they also have strong oscillation close to the core. To avoid that, we use so-called pseudo-potential. And so, um, yeah, I need to be fast if you want to, uh, to have a short thing. So to go to pseudo-potential, the idea is to first freeze the core electron to their atomic uh, position. I'm gonna skip all the details. So the way in which the site to freeze depends on the energy of the, of the system. In some cases, it's obvious. So for instance, here in fluoride, you see that you have uh, the one S electron that, are, that have a way lower energies compared to the two S and two P's. In the case of titanium, it's less obvious whether you need to take these three S and three P in uh, the core or in the valence electrons. And so you need sometimes to test these kind of things. Now I'm skipping the, the mathematics, but basically you can separate the, um, the energy from the core, the contribution of the core to the energy and the valence contribution to the energy. The only exception where you cannot do that easily, that's the exchange correlation part, where in principle that depends on the full density. And so we need to include nonlinear core correction where we only treat the valence uh, electron uh, density. So the idea of the pseudization is to replace the wave functions and the, pseudo and the potential by a potential that's smoother. When uh, we take a pseudo potential that conserve the norm, uh, yeah, we'll show you what needs to be done. But the important thing is that beyond a certain uh, cutoff, our cut here, the pseudo potential is smooth. And above that, it's equal to the one that was existing before. And the same for the wave function, they are smoother in the region of the core and they are uh, equal when we are beyond the core and we impose some continuity in terms of the derivative. I'm gonna skip the stuff about the part, the, the form of the potential. So about nonlinear, so on and so forth. Yeah, in the end, you end up with something like this. You see that we had something that was oscillating to the green is the all electron wave function that's oscillating quite a lot close to the core. And we replace that by a smoother wave function. So that can be described with less G vectors uh, when you look it off. The price to pay is that we have a, a potential that is not a unique potential. So the green one that would be the Z, uh, Z divided by R and it's replaced by something that depends on the moment of the electrons. Yeah, that's it for, uh, for today, okay? Questions? How does this alter the procedure of vacuum? How does? This alter the procedure of vacuum. For example, VASP, yeah. uh, depending on how big you consider your vacuum, the calculations look really hard. And CS, for example, it's yeah. more doable with the same system. Yes. So, would be able to be more like VASP. It's exactly about like VASP because it's plane waves. So the problem of plane waves is that when you take a supercell like this, so with vacuum indeed, I mean the G vectors, they are there. So it's not, you know, in siesta you have a localized basis set. So the big difference is between plane waves versus localized basis set. 
the advantage of plane waves, so it's that it's something that is natural for the um, periodic systems. That's one thing. And the other advantage is the following, this one. I mean, if you want to test whether your basis set is sufficient to describe uh, your wave function, you just need to crank up the cut. You increase the cutoff and you see whether the results depend on that or not. If you use siesta and you want to see whether your wave function is described well enough, you need to add other wave functions to the basis set. And that's more complicated. It's difficult to, to remain orthogonal. Here, the G vectors are naturally orthogonal to the other G vectors. Okay. Okay, let's have lunch. And if you have a question, don't hesitate this afternoon. Whatever you do.